Hey, podcast listeners, Mark Cole back with you on the Maxwell Leadership Podcast. This is the podcast that adds value to leaders who multiply value to others. I'm Mark Cole, CEO of the Maxwell Leadership Organization, but today I'm one of the luckiest guys alive because today joining me on this podcast is not only John Maxwell Live, and uh, that's such a treat, John. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for constantly bringing leadership and your friends to talk leadership. But I'm also joined in the podcast by Don Yeager. Now, you know Don, incredible writer. He, he has this incredible podcast that you need to be a part of, but he's also a Maxwell Leadership thought leader. And uh, he is really helping us expand and grow our legacy to bigger, better, more influential impact. But today he has brought a longtime friend of John's, a longtime household name to the studio with us today. And we're joined by head coach of the Baylor Bears men's basketball team, Scott Drew. Now, you know Scott because he's 2021 National Championship coach. You know him because he has truly been a turnaround coach of transition and transformation. But let me tell you what else you don't, you know or may not know about Scott. He just released in partnership with, with Don Yeager, he released the book, The Road to Joy, how leading with faith, playing with purpose, and leaving a legacy can shape how you lead and interact on a daily basis. And so today I'm excited. You're going to love this podcast. If you would like to download the bonus resource button or bonus resource for this episode, it's a fill in the blank worksheet and you can accompany the conversation with fill in the blanks. Go to maxwellpodcast.com forward slash Scott Drew. That's Scott with two T's. Click the bonus resource button But again, enough about me. My role today is to get out of the way because, Don, first to you, how cool, how incredible was it to work on a project with the Scott Drew (laughs) making his story come to life about the road to joy? Tell us a little bit about that and launch us with the first question. I have to tell you, you know, Mark, uh, John, we've, we've all worked around books and book projects. They're, they're, Every once in a while, you get that opportunity where you just know that not only are you going to get honored to work on someone's book, you're going to grow in the process. And I knew from day one that Scott Drew was going to help me as a, as a man, as a father, as a leader, as a, as a Christian. He was going to help me grow just by the way he conducted himself. And so, Scott, I, I want to jump in because I want to value every second we have on this podcast. You came to Baylor. Uh, as we detail in the book, when basically no one in the world had any interest in the job, right? You had one year of head coaching uh, experience. The program was in trouble. Everyone in the sport knew that NCAA investigations were going to lead to hefty penalties. Why did you believe it was the place for you? And how did you have vision that you could be successful there? Well, first and foremost, this is an honor and privilege being with uh, you and John and Mark today. And uh, um, I I had no idea John actually had helped my dad when he was at Bethel College, gave him some great coaching advice, talked to the team back in the day and helped my dad become the coach that he's become. Obviously, your relationship with Dale Brown had an impact on my dad. My dad gets in the Hall of Fame. I actually learned uh, uh, a couple things from him and we're able to be successful. So I owe you guys a lot. Thank you very much. With that, um, the only whenever you have major life decisions, when you have any decisions, hopefully you're prayerful. And one thing I've always got put on my heart was to coach at the highest level, to have a chance to win national championships um, and to do it uh, uh, honoring him and giving him the honor and glory. And um, Baylor University, largest Baptist school in the nation, uh, the last time they had had a tournament win was 1950. Um, Valparaiso University was the largest Lutheran school at the nation. And their tournament success was about the same. My dad went to Valpo when, when I remember Digger Phelps was like, Homer, you can't go there because it's a dead end job. You'll never win there. Five years later, they, they start to turn it around, have the first winning season. And Valpo becomes a, a household name uh, during the 90s. And that blueprint, I thought we could do just that at Baylor. 
the big reason why you go, God says go. I prayed about it. I felt led to go there. And where people thought we weren't going to be successful at Balpo, we had done that uh, with God's blessing. And I thought we could do the same at Baylor. Wow. Now, I kind of jump on this for a moment because you, you had several probation things on you on your back. You, you hadn't had a successful winning program for many, many years. And yet you turned it around. And one of the things I've always said about leadership is if you really want to know a great leader, they need to be what I call a U-turn leader. And, and a U-turn leader is, a, is somebody that gets an organization when it's going down. It's going down. It's not going up at all. And, and, and then they turn it and they kind of flatten it out and stabilize it. And then they bring it back up. That's, that's a U-turn. You caught it here and you brought it back over to here. To me, that's, that describes you, Scott. You, caught, you, you really caught it at the bottom. And, and, and you just you, you turned around. Help, help all of our listeners. Give me one thought. When you think of taking something that's not doing well and turn it around, what's what's the one thing you, when you look at Baylor that you could just say to me, this is what we did that began to give us hope, began to give us a glimpse of what we could become? Great question. First, there's no shortcuts. I mean, you can't put a piece of duct tape over a leak and expect it to last. And what, what, what we did at uh, uh, Baylor is just what we did at Valpo, and that is we recruited to our niche, people that we thought would represent our university in the way um, that uh, would make our alumni proud, our school proud, and people that would fit in with our school. So you're taking character over talent. And at that point, you bring in enough high character people, and then they start to get more and more talent. And now you have an organization that's that's successful. So with that, uh, so often people take over a job, take over a business, take over a, a, a sports team, and they just try to accumulate talent, but it doesn't fit their culture. And it's not about what's going to make their program successful over the long haul. We knew Early on, when you have five to seven scholarship players and half the team are walk-ons, you're probably not going to win a lot of games. But you know what? We had great quality walk-ons, and the scholarship players we tried to bring in and recruit were ones that we could build on and lay that foundation. Because you know a house has to be built on a solid foundation. And then from there, the talent level increases, and then the success starts to come. Wow, that's so good. Yeah, you, you know, Scott, in the in your book, you tell the story of how you recruited the selection committee when they came to interview you. Tell, tell us a little bit about that story. Well, first, everybody likes to be recruited, right? And I like Dr. Pepper and, and Jim Turner, the CEO of Dr. Pepper's come. And so first, you got to have Dr. Pepper in the room. And then we got to have a decorated green and gold. And you got to have fun in life. I mean, life is short and you want to be around people that make you feel better. And at the end of the day, I felt God was calling me to go to uh, Baylor. So my job was to win the interview. And so often people go into interviews and they don't try to win the interview. And then after the interview is over, they're like, I really want that job, but it's too late. So always win the interview and then you can figure out if you want the job. And, <laughs> and that's, that's the one thing that, that we tried to do. John, oh, yeah, John, it reminds me of you. Every, uh, you. every day you pray for winners. And I know, Coach, right before you came on today, you're recruiting, always recruiting. I love that statement that you say everyone in life wants to be recruited. They want to be won. John, you, you've made a practice of praying for winners every single day. Yeah, since 1981, when I really felt that God began to give me a vision of what I was to do in the world of leadership, I realized immediately, Scott uh, and Don, I was over my head. I, I realized that it, I was not able to do that. And so I, I basically said, okay, God, if that's, if that's what I'm to do, I'm going to pray that you'll send winners to me. And, 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 uh, and since 1981, so you may think about that. I've been doing this for 40 plus years. And we've developed incredible companies. But, but it's because the people that God has sent to me, and, and I have, because I'm a person of faith, there are times when I meet them, and when I meet them, I can sense in my heart that God's saying, I just brought you another one. So okay. about, any time, about any time I want to say, boy, we're really doing amazing, I think, well, really, God sent me the players, and once you have the players, once you have the players, you can do something with it. You know as well as I, you, you know, it, you, you can't substitute for talent. You know, if, if, 
if you're a track coach and you want to need a high jumper, you don't need seven guys that can jump one foot. That ain't going to make it. You got to get some talent. And, and, but when you put talent on it, what I like, Scott, is you, you put talent with character. And, and, and basically, you said, I'm going to go get some character kids. They're just good kids, represent us well. We're not, going to, we're not going to win a lot in the beginning, but it's all right. We're going to get a foundation. And then you started attracting the talent. And I think, I think, I think, you, I think you did it right. Well, and, and like you said, God blessed us with a great staff, with great players, because you don't accomplish anything on your own, and it's his glory. And that's why we wrote the book, right, Don? Amen, brother. Amen. And, you know, Scott, I got to, you know, one of the best videos your your wonderful wife found in the run up to the 2021 championship, she found the video, the old time of VHS, right? That's how old this was, yeah. of, of your press conference when they were introducing you as the head coach at Baylor, right? We already, def- the, the, we already explained it was a horrible job. Nobody wanted it, but you walk in, there's a handful of players who every, all the good ones had already left. And I, and I interviewed the ones who were there, so I'm not insulting anybody, but, but, but you're there and you walk in and you declare, I came here to win a national championship. And, wow. and I've talked to several of those players who, who said the eye roll in the room was, was <laughs> like, you could hear the eye roll. That's how, that's how, that's how dramatic it was. Now they're all thinking you're nuts. Where does the positivity come from first? I'd love to know that. But secondly, how important is it to declare something big when you're stepping into a new environment? Well, we know without a uh, uh, vision, the people perish. And uh, as far as the vision, uh, I'm blessed. My dad is uh, one of the most positive people uh, uh, that I've come across. And the other most positive is, is Dale Brown. And then you two jump in the mix. So, I mean, I got a bunch of positive people around me and the glass is half full with me. So, uh, I definitely, uh, uh, knew that this is why, uh, I was interested in being at Baylor and, and hopefully God was calling me for that purpose. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I, I knew that, uh, uh, I mean, we went to the sweet 16 at Valpo. And literally, we're two wins away from a Final Four, and now you're going to a better conference in a bigger school. Why can't you win a championship here? And uh, we all know who God calls. I mean, he calls the Davids. He calls the Gideons. He calls Moses that's a stutter. I mean, like, I, I know I'm not Goliath. So, anyway, I know it's God, and uh, uh, to him be the glory. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm here for the ride. <laughs> you know, you know. So, you know, Scott, when you talk, when, when, when Don's talking about you went there and you, you, you said uh, we want to win a national championship, you know, leaders always go first. They always go first. And, and, and when, you, when you made that statement, a couple of things happened. One is um, you declared yourself. You declared you, you, you set your standards of expectation higher than the people. But when you did that, you began to raise the expectation of the people. Uh, somebody's somebody's got to raise that level. And when you made that statement, you allowed people to begin to believe again. The second thing you did when you did that is you validated the importance of leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Always has been, always will be. And to me, that day, what the people found is they, they probably got a great coach. But what they also got was a great leader. And I, I've known people that can coach that really aren't great leaders. I've known people that are leaders that really aren't so good coaches. And I would say that you are a leader coach. And, and that, that, set, that kind of set the bar for who you were, what you expected of yourself. Nobody else set that bar for you. And that's another thing. I think great leaders, they always set their own bar. I, I, I never expect anybody to set my bar higher than I set it for myself. My expectations of who I am and what I need to be I set for myself. In fact, I think you're in trouble when somebody else is setting the bar for you and they're raised and you're trying to, to get there. And obviously you did that when you, when you arrived at Baylor. See, that's why I wanted to be on this podcast. You got me motivated. See, <laughs> you, you got to have someone to motivate the motivator. <laughs> hey, podcast listeners. 
How would you like to be equipped with the tools to continue your personal growth and refine your strengths and weaknesses, all while being surrounded by growth-minded leaders like yourself? You may have heard of our International Maxwell Conference, or IMC. It's our biannual event in which Maxwell Leadership certified team members come from all around the world to grow and learn together. IMC this August is the first time we're opening the event to the public by kicking the event off with our first first ever personal growth day. This is a one and a half day event on August 29th and 30th in Orlando, Florida. And it's designed to dig deeper into who you are and how you tick so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're unable to attend personal growth day in person, we also offer virtual access to the event. If you would like to participate in a one-of-a-kind experience and stand shoulder to shoulder with growing leaders who will sharpen your skills and equip you to create powerful, positive impact in your life, go to maxwellleadership.com forward slash personal growth day to learn more or get your ticket. We'll see you there. I, I wish all of you were visually tuning in today. We're so thankful for all of you. But if you're tuning in, you see our our guest today is uh, Coach Scott Drew. And you see right behind his right shoulder, the National Championship Trophy from 2021. You see right in front of that, the new book, The Road to Joy, which, by the way, you've got to all pick it up. I'm going to tell you how at the end of the show here today. Uh, but you see, you, there you go, John. John's holding it up. Van, Vanna White is right there holding <laughs> up. The and look at Don. There you go. Look at Don. Look, look at Don's holding it up. I'm holding it up. <laughs> you got to tune in. You got to tune in. If he's Vanna White, who's Don? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Betty White. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you see the big Baylor. You see the big Baylor University logo behind you, Coach, and then every once in a while you just throw that right hand up, and we see some significant bling on that finger. That's I, how he works his bicep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hey, but that looks like a weight. Yeah. Let's go back and talk about the road to that ring. Let's go back and talk about the road to joy because you had a lot of chances to choose something other than joy. In fact, in 2020, it looked like you had every chance in the world to win the national championship and then COVID cancels the championship tournament. Then you find yourself in 2022 putting the players in, in the bubble. This is where they locked them down in Indianapolis. And the only way the team could win was to enjoy one another, was to eat with one another, live with one another, practice in an airtight kind of bubble. Talk a little bit about how you built camaraderie in the group and how you maintained that high morale. Well, before we get to that great question, you asked about the size of the ring. It is the largest ring that this company's ever made. Toronto Raptors made the largest, and, you know, we're, we're in the winning. So this one is larger than theirs. Now, the difference is in the NBA, those diamonds are a little bit bigger and real. Um, <laughs> the, the, these are college <laughs> ones. They're not. So, But it is it is a big, big ring. and something that uh, uh, the players can show off and be proud of. Uh, as far as in the bubble, uh, one one thing great leaders do um, from listening to uh, Don and uh, John often talk is you, you, you got to get advice, the smart take from the strong. And one of the people I talked to was Dabo Sweeney. And I said, when you go to uh, 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 the college football playoff, what do you do with your players for that week? And very similar to in a bubble when you're secluded. And, and the biggest takeaway was, was having fun with them. And we did a lot of things from uh, Uno tournaments to karaoke to Connect Four, um, you name it, uh, movie night. Uh, we just had a blast. You could tell teams were ready to leave the bubble when, when they're like, I just can't wait to get out of here. And then when we would win, we're like, yes, we get to stay in the bubble. Now, being the number one seed, we had a big team room. So that was a little different. We had a lot of area to have fun. And at that point, if you ever wanted to be a number one seed, that was the year to do it. But uh, uh, again, for those that if you're having fun, you're enjoying one another, you love one another, you're going to fight harder for each other. And I thought that was great advice from uh, uh, Dabble. Yeah, you, Don, you know, you you got him to tell you more of that story as you wrote it in the book. Kind of what was your takeaway that would, would kind of apply to a business team uh, as it relates to creating a bubble? 
I think the thing that really struck, strikes me, Mark and, and, and John, is that this idea that, that w- most of us in business, we, we are not in a bubble, right? We live our lives and, and, and the five o'clock happens, everybody takes off. Um, so what you find is that there are special organizations that enjoy their time together, right? They enjoy the presence of each other. And, and those in those organizations, just that, that opportunity to do something special is real. Um, I, I think when you find it corporately in, or that if there are, if there are some catalysts, right? Some corporate culture carriers within your team who are able to inspire folks, let's all go to lunch or let's, Let's, uh, let's all go to the spaghetti factory, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Something that will allow you to have a little time together is a, is, is a corporate takeaway from what Scott did um, and what they were able to do. He's right. There were a number of teams, and I interviewed folks who were in that tournament um, for other pieces that I did who their team could not wait. It sounds silly to say, could not wait to lose because they kind of didn't want to be trapped all there together that they didn't want that much together time. Right. And, uh, and then there were teams that, 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 that thrived in it. That's what our goal should be as we build our organizations. How do we learn to love and enjoy each other so much that we are, we travel in our own sort of bubble. Yeah. Now, you know, as you talk about that bubble to adversity in that situation, you know, what, what, what's incredible about adversity is it separates the players from the pretenders. Always does. And, and, and what happens is you form in that culture, in that bubble culture, what you did coach is, is you formed a, 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 a you had a family, yeah. you had a family. Yeah. And, and by the way, this family played basketball, mm-hmm. but, but you had a family, you had a family. You, 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 and, and so when they went out on the basketball floor, their care and love for each other shows up. Yeah. It shows up. Te- teammates help each other a lot more if they love them than they do if they don't care for them. And, and you develop that. And I think that, again, it's a beautiful, for all of our podcast uh, listeners and viewers, Mark, I think it's a beautiful example of regardless of what the situation is, you can develop a culture yeah. that can take the very best out of the very worst and do well in it. So we've all been, uh, uh, to, to chime in and add to that, we've all been at restaurants and places. One comes to mind, uh, breakfast place this morning that everybody loves to go to because the employees are always smiling. They're always happy. It's a good vibe. They'll go the extra mile for you. And as, as a business leader, as a head coach, you got to create that environment for your workplace. If it's sure. a place people can't wait to get out of, then when you step in there, you pick that up. You feel that energy. You know if it's dysfunctional versus family and love. Yes. Well, it, it is true. And, and staying on this bubble, Coach, you absolutely – I love one of one of my favorite anecdotes in the book is this window that you created. You talked about Phase 10, Uno, and all that. But one exercise you led your team in as a part of this bubble building, bubble team building, was a discussion about fear. Mm. You ask everyone in the room to open up about a fear they had. And then guess what you did? You did what you do, what you did, what leaders do. You started with an omission that really, truly stunned everybody in the room. Tell us a little bit about that story. Well, first and foremost, I was smart enough to go to one of our past players, who's a very successful coach, who gave me that advice of the thing that's helped them the most because they've won, I think, three national titles. And he talked about uh, uh, just what he's done with his team. And one of the most effective things is uh, when people feel most stressed and pressured, that's when uh, uh, we know for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, sound mind. We want to be fearless. And one of those ways is to talk about a fear. And with me, I talked about, uh, uh, to be honest, you're always worried about things you can't control. One thing you can't control is officials. And not being uh, a recognized, uh, a four-time national champion, Hall of Famer, somebody that gets a lot of calls in my mind, I was worried with, and I don't curse out officials, would that hurt our team in a close game and a close situation? I didn't want that to hurt our team or cause us to lose. And that was a fear. And you know what? When you have a family member and you see another family member say they have a fear, well, what do you do if you love someone? You want to help them. Right away, the players speak truth into the fear, like, coach, it's not going to cause us a game, and we're going to be up so big, it ain't going to matter, you know? (laughs) And you were, and you were. (laughs) 
But you know, Mark, what I love about that is, is, is he shared that story with me and we're writing the book. I mean, think about the, the, um, what it takes. And John, I can't wait for you to speak into this as a leader to, to open up and tell the team, my greatest fear is that I'm not big enough for you, right? That my name isn't so big that the official will be, will, will, will make the call on our behalf. And, and, and by saying that, like saying, I'm afraid that I'm not big enough for you. Um, they, th- as he said, they all shared with me how much they rallied around him because they were like, no coach, it ain't going to, it's not going to get to that place. And, and w- I mean, but the strength to say that really opened up some amazing doors in that meeting. Yeah. What coach Scott showed us right there was the fact that he wanted to have friends, not fans. You know, if you want to have fans, you create a, a large gap between you and the people. And, and you you act perfect and, and 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 you make people think you're bigger and better than you really are. But but when you want friends, you close that gap. And and what coach you what you did is you just said, look, I, I want you know, I have fears too. And and let me tell you what it is. And immediately when you told them that, every one of them that all of them had fear of some kind of uh, toward that game, what you did is you you became approachable. And then all of a sudden they began to identify with you. And then the next thing is you got allies from all your players. They said, we're not going to let that happen to coach. We're going to get so far in the head of the game. Hey, if he does something stupid, it is going to cost us the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 but, you, but what you did, coach, is you closed the gap. You, just, you closed the gap. And that's what, that, that's what makes it work all greatly. If, if you're a step ahead of your leaders, or of your players, you're a leader. If you're a mile ahead of your players, you're a martyr. And, and there's a lot of difference between that. And you, you, stay, you stay close enough to connect with them so that they can identify with you. And so now all of a sudden, it's everybody helping everybody because we're all together in this. And you did a great job with that, Coach. That's a great story. I love that story. Well, and so we're, we're coming to a close here. But, Coach, uh, I've, I've met – championship basketball coaches. I, I've met some, even some coaches that's done a turnaround as you've done, but the fact that you want to get this story out in the book, The Road to Joy, I want to thank you. I, I appreciate it. The book is impacting. Tell me, what is it that you're hoping people will get out of this book? If there's an underlying thought, what are you wanting them to capture from this book? Well, well, as coach which is you always try to improve the way that you coach or, or you instruct or you lead. And we've always had a Christ centered program, but um, really taking it from Dungy who and Dabo an easier way to keep priorities is just play with a, a, a culture of joy. That's Jesus, others, yourself. And in everything you do, if you can remember that priority list, um, you're doing things for Jesus. You're doing things for others. You're going to accomplish so much more if that why is third. And uh, um, the reason the book was written was to talk about uh, just how God's blessed our program and also share just what uh, 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 the players, administration, uh, the coaches have helped achieve. Hopefully we grow a a Baylor nation from it. Uh, But at the end of the day, God's given us a great platform and we want to give uh, the honor and glory back to him. Don, your biggest takeaway in writing this book and what do you think readers are going to get from it? I think my biggest takeaway um, was that that a lot of times we look at situations and we think they're just impossible. Um, you know that there's just and and we and we and we think that those people who, as we've already described in this interview, who make declarations are just a little nuts. But if if you do it in incrementally, right? Scott didn't try to turn this thing around overnight. I mean, it it sounds it's the greatest turnaround story in sports, but it took it took 19 years, right? So it's, it's not like this happened overnight. Every year they were just chipping away at this challenge. And there were, there were moments that it didn't work. So that's the real key here is that very little of the, of the greatest things we'll hope to achieve will happen quickly. Almost all of them will take us time. If you're willing to invest it, invest it properly, man, amazing things are ahead. Beautiful. Yeah. And John, I, I didn't know this until we were doing some preliminary conversations before we started recording, but you've been a part of Coach Drew's dad, taking him and his team out to dinner. That Coach Drew, you're, he's going to research. He might have been there as an 11-year-old boy. John, I hope that doesn't make you feel old there. But um, <laughs> it does. It yeah. does. 
but tell move us on. <laughs> move on quickly. <laughs> but just any final closing comments about Coach Drew and getting to meet him here and hopefully going to watch him and, and his team play soon. Yeah, Coach. Uh, the thing that I I, I I pulled from our conversation today and knowing you is that you're developing a a, a culture that is going to be a, a place that good ball players want to come to. Uh, I, I think the secret is the fact that um, it, it's not diagramming plays and, and it, 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 it's, it's creating a home, a home where, where people can feel loved and cared for and can give love. And I, I think I, 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 I'm reading the book. I, I haven't finished it, but I'm reading the book right now. And let me tell you what I think. I think there are going to be a whole bunch of high school good ball, basketball players read this book. Yeah. And they're going to say, that's where I want to go. I, I, I want to get in this culture of, of fun, enjoyment, loving your life, uh, caring for one another, uh, getting right priorities in your life, a, a place where I can have faith and where I can, where I can reach my potential. So I, I look at you as, as, I think you're going to have many, many years of, of being in the NCAA tournament. I, I think you're going to see another trophy over your, over your left-hand shoulder. <laughs> and then we'll put one up behind your head. I like how and, you and, think. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, be, be, and, and, and it's because you're developing a culture that's going to be conducive for success. Because success is, you take your players from success, which it's all about me. And you take them to significance, which is all about others. And you are developing a significant culture. And I'm, I, hey, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Well, and, and again, Thank you, Don, for holding up the hanky right this time. Um, we, we do. We're here at the at the Maxwell Leadership Podcast. We we really do feel challenged to train leaders, to develop leaders that'll bring about powerful, positive change. And we do this because we believe everyone deserves to be led well. And Coach, I watch what you've done in your program, and you've shown us that boys basketball, boys need to be led well, not just by you, but by each other. And we admire you from afar now. We admire you close up. I'm going to challenge all of our listeners, all of our viewers today. Go to the show, note, show notes, maxwellpodcast.com forward slash Scott Drew, Scott with two T's. We'll put the link in there of how to order the book. You can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you like to buy your books. You can get this book. And not, hey, do me a favor. Get this book for yourself, but get this for a teammate too. Maybe it's an up-and-coming basketball player. Maybe it's somebody that just needs to understand the power of, of teams and building a team bubble. Whatever the situation is, I can tell you the book's going to impact you. Don Yeager, you're a champ. John Maxwell, you are a champ. You impact us every single week. And now Coach Scott Drew, thank you. Let's go get another championship together. Well, thank, you. thank you for having me. And it's a blessing learning from you guys. Thank you. 